POV, you're importing some random internet model into Houdini and it's a f***ing shit show. Well, hold up, take a breath, we're gonna get through this together. You're not the first and you won't be the last. The sad truth is that most people don't natively use Houdini. So at some point, probably soon, you're going to encounter some kind of proprietary, inferior format, most likely patented by Autodesk in a desperate attempt to control the industry. Yes, here we are. The year is 2006 and we are importing either an Alembic or an FBX because this is the new industry standard. What's that you say? It's 2024? Well, you know what? It's still easier than USD, so let us proceed. In this video, we're going to run through some examples on static FBX geometry, and then in the next one, we'll get into some more advanced situations, and then we'll move on to some Alembic stuff. We won't be touching on rigged FBX or full imported scenes in this series as there's just too much to cover there, maybe in the future. To be honest though, USD is coming in hot and I think it's about time I stop being so stubborn and start making the switch. So there will more than likely be some content about that in the future. For now though, let's take a look at understanding how Houdini sees an FBX file and what an FBX file even is to begin with. Um, I just grabbed this model from Sketchfab, and there's a link in the description if you want to follow along. So first up, we have this branching ice fungus asset by Gavin P. Gamer one Thanks, Gavin. And this is a cool little asset because you get six variations, which is great if you're doing some set deck or something and you want to scatter a bunch around and have slightly different models. So you might be tempted to import these through the vanilla Houdini menu, and let's see what happens when we do that. So let's go to File, Import, Filmbox, FBX. FYI, FBX is an abbreviation of Filmbox. The technology was developed by an independent software company which was acquired by Autodesk, just in case you were wondering. And we are now presented with this page of options. You can leave these as is. The only thing you might wanna change is this convert units box here so that Houdini will automatically convert everything to meters and your geometry won't come in at like Godzilla scale. So we can see at the top of this pop-up that we're going to import everything here. Lights, cameras, materials, rig, information, yada yada. So this will import an entire scene, assuming that data exists in the FBX file. Which is a cool feature, but um, some of the time, sometimes it is overkill. So let's hit OK for now and see what we've got. We can see that Houdini has created a subnet inside of our OBJ context, and if we dive in there we can see that yes indeed, we have a light, we have a camera, and we have a separate geo container for each of our six frozen river plants. Now, maybe this is what you want, and if so, you can stop watching now and merrily go about your day, blissfully unaware that there might be a better way. But if you're like me, you probably find this slightly annoying and weird, and you want to know why it is this way. Now, for six little models, it's no biggie. But if you try this with a larger file, which I'll show you in the next lesson, you will see that it can become quite cumbersome and borderline unusable when you've got tens or sometimes even hundreds of these uh, uh, geo containers. Let's talk a bit about how Houdini is parsing the FBX file here for a better understanding. FBX is a relatively smart format in that it keeps track of some important information when it's exported. I'll show you what I mean. If we go into Cinema 4D or any DCC software and just create a couple objects, let's say four cubes, we can see that they all come in with their default names. Now let's export this as an FBX. Pull it into Houdini and we can see that it comes in with a default name attribute that roughly matches the name from Cinema 4D. Cool. But what if all the cubes in Cinema 4D have the same name? Will that trip it out? Let's try. Back in Houdini, if we inspect the name, we can see that these cubes have actually been automatically been given a slightly different name of their own. So there's no way to confuse them. Sweet. Now, what happens if we put all the cubes into a null and then export? Well, in Houdini, we can see that the FBX now reflects that path in the name attribute. This is really, really handy when you get into more complex stuff. And if you remember the video about group syntax, you'll remember that we can use any part of this path to grab multiple items. Like when we only wanted to isolate the right side of Craig. Remember? That was fun. Now contrast this with OBJ. It's an older and not dumber, but simpler format. Let's export just the four cubes to an OBJ and see what that gets us. In Houdini, we can see we have four cubes and they all have names. That's great. However, if we put these cubes into a null and export and open a Houdini, we can see it does not keep track of its own hierarchy. FBX for the win. 
Now this is where it gets really interesting because if we put a couple cubes nested under other cubes and export that, if we open up in Houdini we can see that these cubes are actually gone now. They just don't exist at all. So that's not great. And to hammer this home, if we export this same setup with FBX, open in Houdini, not only do we still have this geometry, but we can see the exact hierarchy in which it was built. In the next video, I'll show you a couple techniques to create your own data if for some reason life hands you lemons or an OBJ and you need to make lemonade or something in 3D. Anyway, back to these frozen river plants, branching ice fungus. I don't know why these are called frozen river plants, but these are called branching ice fungus. Uh, hopefully Gavin P Gamer 1 didn't just like grab some other thing and then rename it because that would be weird, Gavin P Gamer 1. Anyway. Before we delete this whole subnet business, let's import the same thing but manually and compare the data we get between the two methods. So create a geo node and a file sop and we'll pull that file in. And this method is not going to auto convert the scale for us. So 99% of the time you're gonna to need to drop down a transform and scale it to 0.01 as most softwares work in centimeters, which are 1 100th of the scale of Houdini's meters. So if we go to object level and toggle these, we can see that we roughly have the same thing happening. So let's check out the file node we just made and take a look at the attributes. We can see that on the point level, we have these speci FBX specific attributes here. And in the prims, we have this name attribute. Now, if we go back to the subnet, well, right off the bat, we can see that Houdini has imported a light, a camera, created this full material network. So that's nice. Maybe later we can steal some of this stuff for our other setup. Now drill down into the file node in one of these containers and check out the attributes. You can see that none of these attributes exist here. No name, no translation, so what's the deal? Well, this is because Houdini has already internally processed all these attributes as metadata, metadata, as metadata on, imp on import. If you look at the file path here and you see you can see this weird hashtag thing and then beside that is actually the value of the name attribute. This is a special token on FBX import that isolates all the primitives that have that specific name or path attribute. If you check the other file nodes, they will represent the other name values of the other river plants or ice fungus. Now, as for the translation values, if you highlight one of these geo containers, you can actually see that these values have been directly applied to their transforms. The rotations will be different because Houdini has converted them into degrees from radians, which also we will talk about in the next lesson. And also now remember that we converted the units on import, aka divided them by 100. So the actual numbers in here are much smaller and more manageable than the attributes in our manual SOP import. Okay, fun times. Now you're probably wondering why bother with a custom import method when everything's already done for us here. And the truth is a lot of times this will be fine. It may even be better and faster. I just wanna show you guys other ways of handling files for a variety of situations including situations where you don't get the data you need or want. Also, as I said before, and as we'll see later, when you get a bigger file with tons of models, it may actually be quicker just to do this stuff yourself. First off, let's look at how we can use these plants in a simple instancing setup, and we'll look at both import methods. With the default import, first we'll need to get all, these, all of this geo in one place. So let's make a geo node, and in there we'll create an object import, make six slots here, and we'll grab each little piece. They're huge now, so we have to select this dropdown and click into this object, which takes the transforms from, the, from an object level, aka these geo nodes, and applies it to this geo in here. Okay, so now because these pieces didn't come in with a name attribute, we're going to actually have to create one so that our copy to points can use that for instancing. So let's do it like we did it before in the first lesson of this series. We'll drop down a for each connected piece. And now for some reason we have mm, 64 pieces. It seems this geo is not as clean as it had initially appeared. Classic internet. Luckily, all we have to do is go back into this object merge and hit pack geometry before merging, and that will sort it out for us in this case. Yay. Cool, so now we've got all the pieces, but they're not at the origin, so if we instance them, they'll be all offset and weird. So inside the loop, let's drop down a match size. This node is indispensable for this type of operation, and we'll be exploring it more down the road. But for now, just know that it takes whatever geo you want and puts it at the origin. Let's just change the y-axis option here to min so it's sitting on top of the grid and bada bing, we are good to go. Now just create some points, create a name attribute. I'm just going to use a fixed value here to save time, but go watch the instancing video if you wanna know how to randomize this procedurally. 
Copy to points, turn on the name attribute, and there you go. If we adjust the name value on the template points here, we can see that our little river plants are coming in nicely. Now let's see a technique for getting the same thing to work, but with, an, with the alternate manual import method. Okay, so in here we've got our file node, and then we're scaling everything down by 100. First up, let's delete all these meta attributes we don't need, because it's just good practice to keep your geo as lean as possible. Attribute delete, we'll get rid of all these FBX attributes here, and then this detail attribute called var map. Now we have a name attribute ready to go, so we can run a loop on that by saying for each named primitive. And just like last time, we'll put down the match size, set the Y to min. Now in order to instance based on the name, the name value on the template points has to match the name value of the primitives. And if we look at our name value on the primitives, they are, well, very long and awkward. So we're actually going to need to clear out each name attribute and replace it with the iteration value. Real quick, we'll delete the attribute, then create a meta node for the loop, drop down a prim wrangle, wire up the meta, and type i at name equals detail, one, iteration, zero, semicolon. Once again, if you're curious about this code, we've covered it in earlier videos, but the TLDR is that we're assigning a new name attribute based on the current iteration of the loop. This is kind of manually doing what the connectivity SOP does, but in Houdini and life, the more ways you know how to do something, the better. So let's grab our little points set up from the other node, pipe that in, and there you go. Same result, different method. Again, neither of these approaches are perfect. I think this manual one is probably a little quicker and a little cleaner. Everything is contained within one node and you don't need to create this awkwardly large object import thing. However, the default import method has the advantage that if you want to edit one of these river plants, say add some displacement or whatever, you can just jump right into its container, edit it at the source, and then when you spawn it in, it will just come in all edited and nice. Plus it has its own light, camera, and materials all set up. Sometimes I import both ways and just steal that stuff from my manual setup and delete the geo out. It will really depend on your specific situation. Okay, well, that is all for this one, folks. I hope you enjoyed this little introduction to FBX processing. In the next video, we'll take a look at some more complex scenes and advanced topics, and you will be well on your way to thinking like Houdini. Bye!